Hello again and welcome. In this video we're going to continue our discussion on waveguides. I'd like to start out by addressing a couple of comments that people had posted on the previous video. One of the questions was on the waveguides themselves. When I was bending this, how did I actually do that? This material is actually quite thick. You can see this is uh, 32 thousandths thick versus this. This is uh, 16 thousandths. So this is fairly easy to bend. So after bending the material, just using a standard bender, I place the flat side into a vise. Then I tap this all down with a ball-peen hammer, basically to give me a sharper edge. Again, the inside radii has to be less than 10% of the broad width. Let me see if this one shows this up a little better. Yeah, maybe right in here. You can see the peen marks. Now I did the same thing even with this large waveguide. Again, you can see right along here. Uh, that might show up pretty good. There's my peen marks. Again, with this having a very broad width, that little bit of a radii really doesn't matter. Someone else had posted about doing some 3D printed waveguides. They suggested that I go watch the signal path that he had done a video on it. And indeed, if you do a search for 3D printers, I think, on his channel, that video is fairly long, but if you scan all the way towards the end of it, he shows some waveguides that he's tried to 3D print. And he coats that plastic with some paint from MG Chemicals. It's a highly conductive paint. I believe that the stuff he used was a copper or silver base. I think the best paint that they offer is about $180 for a 6 ounce can. I'm not sure. Go to Amazon maybe or go to their website and you can check it out. So I spent some time doing some searching on the internet and I found a few people doing 3D printed waveguides. It looked like the more successful ones that were printing in metal. So I'm thinking I might give that a try. If I do, I'll probably put that all in a video by itself. So during the first video I showed this circuit. This was allowing us to extend the frequency range of the light VNA beyond the 9.3 gigahertz that they currently limit it to. It also allows us to extend the dynamic range at those higher frequencies. Again, this is nothing more than two mixers, one to do the up conversion and one to do the down conversion. And then I have a fixed local oscillator that's feeding the LO of these. The output of the up conversion mixer feeds through a filter. And again, this is used to select one of the two sidebands. In my case, I'm currently using the upper sideband. This amplifier gains back what we lost going through this mixer conversion. We have two different attenuator pads. There's one on the output of the amplifier and then one on the input of the mixer. And these are just there to provide us with a match. Now I started out with just a 6 dB attenuator on the input of this mixer, but the performance was kind of poor. I ended up adding another 6 dB attenuator here. You know, towards the end of that video, I showed a couple of graphs and one of them was where I placed several attenuators in series and I just started stacking them up. So I started off at like 0 dB and I went to 10, 20, 30. And I think I took it all the way down to 50 dB and I believe I was running this system at like 11 gigahertz or something. But the point of that is to show that we could actually use this system to take some decent measurements at some fairly high frequencies. This isn't something that you could do with the light VNA using the harmonic mode. So what I'd like to do today is focus on the circuit and how can we prove that this thing is actually doing what I claim it does. So I think the very first thing that we want to look at is what is the frequency at this point here? Is it really the upper sideband? Is it the upper and lower? How would we even know? So when I stack these attenuators in here, for example, how did we even know that I was running at whatever frequency it was, 11 gigahertz? Maybe it was only 6 gigahertz, and, you know, the performance of these was actually quite good, where if you actually ran them at 11 gigahertz, maybe their performance is very poor. Here I have one of my RF generators. So again, remember, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 8. So let's have a look at the frequency counter. Again, these two are just attached to each other, and you can see 1.234567898. So the reason that these two match is they're both using a 10 megahertz reference clock. That goes back to a GPS receiver. So we're using that satellite system to create our 10 megahertz reference that basically drives all of the timing equipment in my lab. So we can make some fairly accurate timing measurements with this equipment. So the first test we're gonna do is we're gonna tap into this node right here with our frequency counter. Again, this T is a splitter. 
This is our local oscillator and this happens to run at 7.860 gigahertz. Again this is a DRO and this is locked to our reference oscillator at 10 megahertz. Again that feeds off the GPS receiver. Here's our splitter. This is the output feeding back to our counter and you can see we're right dead on at 7.86 gigahertz. So with this simple test we know that the DRO is running at the correct frequency and we know that it's locked to our GPS receiver. Just for fun, let's disconnect the GPS receiver. And you can see this will hunt around while it's trying to lock to essentially nothing. But it runs a little bit high. We could actually perform these experiments probably without that reference oscillator. But we'll go ahead and use it because it's available. Again, just looking at our frequency extender. All the cables are custom made. And that's all out of this hard line. Alright, so the next thing I'd like to do is tap into this leg right here. Again, we have our local oscillator at 7.86 gig. Feeds through this mixer, which is mixing essentially with nothing right now. That goes through our image rejection filter, through an amplifier, and then through our 3dB pad. So that's this signal here. And watch what happens when we hook this up to our counter. It should read garbage. You can see it's jumping around. Here we're at 12, 13, 14 gig. It's definitely not stable. And that's because, again, we have this image rejection filter here. Again, our RF input is mixed with the LO, and that gives us this upper and lower sideband. We've said that we're interested in the upper sideband, so we've essentially filtered out this 7.86 gigahertz. So what we're seeing here is basically noise. Of course, if we were to remove the image rejection filter, we'd see the LO come through on the counter. All right, here you can see I have our light VNA port 1 in yellow. It's attached to port 1 of our extender. Currently the light VNA is set for 2.3 gigahertz. Of course our local oscillator is running at 7.86 gigahertz. So we add those two together and we get 10.16 gigahertz. Fairly close. Again the light VNA does not have a reference input. So it's off by a little bit but you can see fairly close. Unfortunately, as I was turning down that last test setup, I realized I'd forgotten to plug the DRO back into our 10 MHz reference. So not all the error was created by the light VNA. Some of that, again, is because the DRO wasn't locked. But the whole point of showing that was to demonstrate that if we did inject a signal into port 1, mix it with our local oscillator, send it through our image rejection filter, we do indeed get the correct frequency on the output of our extended port 1. Next we have a few different attenuators. These two came from China. They were part of a six piece kit. I don't remember what I paid for that kit. Maybe it was like $20 or something. I thought what we could do is maybe run some comparisons with these. So looking at the software you can see again we have it set for a CW frequency at 2.3 gigahertz. Again having the frequency counter attached to port 1. We know that the mixer, the amplifier and the image rejection filter are all working. So looking at these filters, we can get some idea if the input stage is working as well. So we'll start with our through, and again, let's just re-hit the reference. If we select the max hold, you can see the system is quite stable. So we're going to start with this one here. This is a 3 dB attenuator. I remember these actually work quite well. You can see fairly close to 3 dB. Let's just go ahead and store this now. So here's another attenuator. This is made by Omni Spectra. You can see this is also rated for 3 dB. This is a part number 2082-4182-03. Let's just see how this compares with our Chinese attenuator. I really have no idea what the specs are for this one. Looks like this one's a little worse than the Chinese part. You can see it's off by almost a half a dB. You can go ahead and save that to memory number two. This is our other Chinese attenuator. You can see this one's rated for 6 dB. Boy, check that out. It's almost dead on. Let's go ahead and turn off the other two memories. Very close. Let's save this to memory one. This is another 6 dB attenuator. This one's rated all the way up to 18 gigahertz. 
This one was purchased from Mini Circuits. It a cost of far more than what the Chinese parts cost. <laughs> the cost for this one individual part was about forty dollars. You can see this one's coming in at about minus six point seven or so dB. A little farther out than our Chinese part. Let's just try a couple more. So this one is rated for ten dB. Another part from that Chinese kit. So far I'm pretty impressed with these. Now you'll notice that some of these, like these parts here, they're smooth. So as far as torquing the other connector, we can't really do that. Higher quality parts like this one from Mini Circuits has a hex feature built into the body. Look at this, so 9.978. very close to 10 dB <laughs> this is also a 10 dB attenuator this comes from Midwest microwave and this is rated for DC to 18 gigahertz again notice how this has a hex feature built into the body allowing us to use a second wrench to hold that in place while we torque the other connector interesting so it reads a little low so 10.65 or so these are also 10 dB attenuators from Midwest Microwave. What we can do now is we'll add another one of these in series with this one. And let's just see how close we get to 20 dB. Basically, I just want to give you a feel for the linearity of this extender. Well, you can see it's very close to 20 dB. Let's go ahead and we'll add another one. Alright, so pretty close. You can see it's about 29.2 dB. Again, you'll notice as I'm opening this up, this is the floor. So you have roughly a 50 dB dynamic range. Again, that's frequency dependent. This thing doesn't give you a perfect flat line all the way across the operating range. So with four of these in series, you can see we're getting about 38 dB couple of DB off. Again, I'm not sure what the tolerance of these parts are. These are certainly not metrology grade parts. It's just for fun. This is a 20 DB attenuator that was again supplied with that Chinese kit. What I'm going to do is just remove the last two attenuators. Again, you see it goes right back to where it was. <laughs> So no problems there. Now let's go ahead and install our Chinese part and see how this compares. Again, you really can't torque this because the concern would be this could actually twist this body, which is going to cause that center pin to turn. It'd be better if they had a flat on here, but unfortunately they don't have anything like that. So here you go. So 20 point one maybe versus 19.9 so I don't know if all the parts that they're shipping out of China in these cheap kits perform like this but but the kit that I received it's pretty impressive so next what I'd like to show you is another way to measure the frequency of this system and we're going to do that with a waveguide this came from one of the universities you can see this is an introduction of microwave waveguide bench and measurement source frequency and wavelength assessment so note what they have here. This is just a piece of waveguide, but they've cut a slot into the top side of it. This is called a slotted line. Normally what you do is you have a probe that extends down into the middle of the waveguide, and that attaches to a detector diode, and this goes off to some type of a measurement device. So the idea of this is we can slide this probe up and down the waveguide, and you can see they have kind of a ruler on the side of this. This is to measure the distance. And on the back side of this, they would typically terminate this. Like what they're showing here with a short circuit. So what this is going to do is we slide this up and down the length. We're going to see a pattern of peaks and valleys. And those will be at every one half of the wavelength. So we can use this formula to calculate the frequency 
based on the distance between these valleys. So again we said each valley is at one half of a wavelength. So for the wavelength we're going to look at the distance between two of these. C will be the velocity of propagation of the signal in free space and A will be the broad width of our waveguide. So if you look out on eBay you can actually find some pretty exotic slotted lines. They're still available. I don't know if anybody makes anything like this anymore. But for these demonstrations, I think it's appropriate that we make our own. So this is our slotted waveguide. Again, you can see I have a SMA connector on one end. Again, this has a probe attached to it that extends about halfway down the height of the waveguide. You can see I've cut this slot into the top of the waveguide. I've attached this ruler to the side of it. This is in centimeters. And then I have another SMA that can slide along the length of this waveguide. You'll notice that I don't have the diode, so we'll be attaching this to port 2, our input, and we'll be connecting port 1 of the VNA to this connector here. On the back side of this, we just have some additional length of waveguide. And on the far side, you can then see I have this small piece of brass that just fits into the end, and that becomes our short. And then the whole reason I've left this off is so we can run some additional experiments. This waveguide is again made out of our 1 seconds thick material. And again we talked about how I formed this and you can see where I've hammered this thing down to give me a more defined corner. Again this is not how you're normally going to make a waveguide. Somebody had asked me how well these work if you had these loosely coupled. My experience, not very good. Again, this waveguide has to be fully sealed. Now again, the very first waveguide I made was actually the two halves of the horn here. So these are my transitions. And when I first put this together, I just used rubber bands to hold these parts on. It worked well enough to see that it was acting as a high pass filter and that the cutoff frequency was roughly what I thought it should be. But yeah, <laughs> it didn't work very well. So. When I made this filter, again this is the second thing I put together, I hadn't soldered this because I was again trying to make sure that this thing was going to work. The performance was pretty poor and I was thinking, boy do I have these tubes or anything here wrong? And then I went ahead and soldered up the seam and this started working the way that I expected it to. Somebody had asked about using copper foil. Actually, if you look at this, you can see there's like a layer. This is actually copper foil. So this is double-sided circuit board and you think about it, I have to solder the inner seams together. So what I've done is I've taken this foil tape and I've wrapped that around the circuit board and I've soldered it on both sides and then once I put this together I ran a bead down the length of it. So you can see this is actually made of this foil tape. It's just soldered, flowed all along the length of it. A very crude method, again, this isn't normally how you're going to make a waveguide. I think normally you're just going to purchase these parts. So let me just see if I can show you down the tube. You can see there's nothing inside of this except for a little probe. Again, I can detach this, but you can see there's the slot, and it's just basically a hollow tube with our end capped off here. All right, let's go ahead and we'll hook this thing up to our light VNA. Here you can see I have our light VNA. And again, our port one in yellow attaches to port one of our extender. Port two going to port two of the extender. And then I have our extended port one going to the right hand SMA of our slotted line. And port two of our extender feeding to the actual sliding SMA connector. Once again it's very important that we torque all these connections. So before we do anything else let's just go over a little bit on how this works with the software. Again this software is actually now about 20 years old. I originally wrote it for my HP 8754A VNA. Again that VNA was made in the 1970s and the way it works is it's got overlays that fit over the CRT and you would mark those with a grease pen and you would calculate everything 
manually. So to make it a useful piece of equipment, I interfaced it with a computer and then I wrote this software to allow me to calibrate it and to make simple measurements. So my version of that VNA supports adding a doubler. That allowed me to operate up to, I think, 2.4 gigahertz. So I was trying to run some experiments beyond that. So I actually built a frequency extender for that instrument. I had it kind of working. The problem is I really didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have proper loads. And so I got some data off of it, but I really had no way to prove it out. Because this new software is basically built off of that, it's always had support for adding an extender. So the way that you do that, you go to Setup Diagnostics, and you'll see this button off to the right called Extender. And then there's another selection here for the upper and lower sideband. So if we go back to the main page, and let's just tell it to sweep from 10 meg to 100 meg. So you can see we're in transmission mode. And that's exactly what the software is showing as we're sweeping between 10 meg and 100 meg. Now, if we were to select this extender mode, and let's just set the upper sideband. Let's just change our LO to 10 gigahertz for the fun of it. Makes the math easy. We'll go back to the main. And now, again, because we're working with the upper sideband, you can see that we're sweeping between 10.01 gig and 10.1 gig. So what this allows me to do is just mathematically handle the graph and the touchstone files. If I were to select the lower sideband, you can see we're now sweeping between 9.9 .9 gigahertz and 9.99 gigahertz. So again, the light VNA doesn't know about this extender. So it's starting its sweep at 10 megahertz. So we're taking 10 gigahertz minus 10 megahertz, or 9.99 gigahertz. And then we're working our way down to 100 megahertz, or 10 minus 100, or 9.9 .9 gigahertz. So while the signal on the two ports are actually sweeping in the descending frequencies, our graph is still showing this in the ascending frequencies, just to make it easier to understand. So to use our slide, First thing we want to do is use the CW mode. Again, we're going to try to use the slide to measure frequency, so we want a stable frequency to try to measure. So to run at 10.5 gigahertz, we're going to take 2.64 plus the 7.86, and that's going to be our 10.5. And we can see here on the screen, it's starting off at 10.5 gig. It shows sweeping up to 11.55, but there's no data, and that's because we only have one point. What we do again is select this X axis, and now we can see we're scanning 201 data points, or 0 to 200, and we basically have this line at 20 dB. All right, let's go ahead and we'll select the min max, and now what I'm going to do is just slowly move this probe along the length of our slotted line here. See how the number is going down? Now as I'm working my way along, it's going back up. It's going higher, and now it's going back down again. And here it's going back up. So again, this is what we're expecting our pattern to look like. So it's not a whole lot of change. You can see it's going from about 17 dB to about 21. So about 4 dB a change. But again, the end of the probe here isn't open, so what's happening is all that signal, or the majority of it, is being radiated off of the backside. Again, remember what I said about our waveguide being this hollow tube and essentially shining a flashlight down it? Compared to coax where it would reflect back, the light won't actually reflect back in this case. It's just going to pass on through. And I was explaining how that's very similar to having a load attached on the end of our piece of coax. If the load's impedance happens to match the source impedance, then basically no signal is reflected back. So that's essentially what's going on here. We don't really have any reflection because it's just going off into free space. So again, we have this little stopper, and we'll just slide this into the end of our waveguide. Now watch what happens as I continue to move our little probe along the length of this. See that? Here's a dip right here. So it's very sharp. And 
and let's go ahead and we'll push it up the other direction and right there's our next peak so now you can see we're going between roughly 16 dB and about 45 dB so the amplitude of our signal is much higher so think about that what is VSWR voltage standing wave ratio so what we're looking at with VSWR is the ratio of the peak to the valley and when we had the end of our waveguide open basically no signal is being reflected back so the VSWR is lower now that I've capped off the end of our waveguide we're saying basically all the signal is reflecting back so the ratio of the min to the max is much higher or a much higher VSWR so just keep that in mind as we go through it. Right now we're not really interested in VSWR, but we are interested in measuring this frequency. So before we go on to measure the frequency, so one of the other things I want to mention again is how we talked about calibrating the light VNA using our SOLT. And how that really doesn't apply to our waveguide because we really don't have the idea of an open. We talked about putting a shimmed load or a step load to basically change the phase of that signal. So what I'm going to do, just for the fun of it, We'll go to polar transmission. So to get some data, you can see I'm sweeping between 2.63 and 2.66 gigahertz. Of course, nothing is calibrated. Watch what happens as we start to move our load out a little bit. See how that affects our measurement? All right, let's go back to CW mode. And we'll go back to rectangular. Now I'm going to move our probe to the left until we find our first dip. We're getting close. So right about there. That's 2.4 centimeters. So this would be our first valley at 2.4 centimeters. Now let's continue on down the path. And it's going to be somewhere in here. Okay, again, we'll just start backing this thing up. Oh, right about here. So that is going to be 4.2 centimeters. So again, this is one half the wavelength. So for the full wavelength, we need to go to the next valley. right here so that's going to be 6.1 centimeters the more we can make use of the length of this waveguide the more accurate we can take this measurement so let's see if we can measure one more dip again we don't have to actually work at even wavelengths we just need to know where those dips are it's right here right right there so that looks like about 8.1 centimeters so if we look at the difference between the first two valleys that's going to be 1.8 centimeters between the second and the third 1.9 centimeters so there's a little bit of error in between the third and the fourth 2.0 so again a little bit more error is a reason that they used to make these things very precise now again for our measurement we said instead of using three valleys we'll be using a fourth one so our wavelength works out to 3.8 the speed of light or C is going to be 29.979 centimeters per second now the width we said for our WR90 waveguide is 22.85 millimeters that gives us a frequency of 10.260 gigahertz. So you can see we're off a little bit, but not that bad for what we're working with right now. Now I suspect the majority of this error probably is not so much in measuring the slide. I mean, the ruler is going to be accurate. The problem is going to be the mechanical dimensions of our waveguide. So as I'm building these, you can imagine I'm shearing up this brass, I'm bending it, and then I'm pounding it with a hammer. So my width and height are going to be off from what the actual waveguide is. So let's just have a look. 
So it looks like 21.93 or so. So using our measured width of 21.93 millimeters, that gives us a frequency of 10.438 gigahertz. Very close to our 10.5 gigahertz that we're running it at. Let's go ahead and change the frequency of the nano. We'll increase it by 1 gigahertz. So this will give us a center frequency of 11.5 gig. We'll reset our max hold. Let's just turn off samples for now. You can see again we're starting off at 11 gigahertz. And now we'll reselect our max hold. And let me just again, we'll slowly scan through this. Oh, right there. Okay, so that's 7.7 .7 centimeters. And again, we'll continue looking for our next valley. Okay, looks like it's coming up. Oh, went too far, didn't we? Yep. Right. Right. Oh, right there. Alright, that's 6.1 centimeters. And again, we'll look for our third dip. You can just see this is a very touchy measurement. <laughs> it's like right at 4.5. Okay, so 4.5. And now let's check our last one. Again, it's very critical too that the end load doesn't move at all. Right there. It's so like 2.8 centimeters. So again, looking at the delta between the valleys, we've got 1.7, 1.6, and 1.6. So on par with what we measured before. Again, I'm just kind of doing this as a sanity check to make sure that my measurements are accurate. So that gives us a wavelength of 3.2666 centimeters. And again, if we use our measured 21.93 millimeters, that gives us a frequency of 11.436904 gigahertz. Very close to 11.5. And as a matter of fact, look at this. So 436.9. 438 I'd say 437 438 it's fairly close now again this waveguide it's not gonna be square I mean the width down here is probably different than the width over here which is different than the width here versus here I mean this thing is not gonna be a precision piece of equipment here again we're just trying to use this to get an idea as far as how the waveguides behave not to make any kind of precision measurements so let's go ahead and we'll try it at a lower frequency. So we'll just take this down to 1.64 and you can see that gives us a frequency of 9.5 gigahertz. And we'll reselect max hold. Oh, also notice obviously we're running at a higher frequency here. So the wavelength for 11.5 gigahertz versus 10.5 gigahertz, it's a little shorter. So the distance between these valleys is going to get shorter as we go up in frequency and wider as we go down in frequency. So again, we'll start sweeping our slide looking for our first valley. And... Boy, what's coming up right here? Very close. Well, that's going to be it, isn't it? Right? Yep. So that's 1.4 centimeters. Okay, and we'll continue on. You can see I'm kind of squeezing this connector between my two thumbs to get better control over it. Well, right about there, call it 3.8 centimeters. And let's see, so. Yep, here it comes. Oh, right about there. Right there. 
call it 6.1 centimeters might run out of slide here it's gonna be very close to the end of this all right let's see here here's eight 8.1 oh it's coming down two three oh it's dipping fast oh right there right there 8.4 so again looking at the difference between the first two dips it's 2.4 then 2.3 and again 2.3 that gives us a wavelength of 2.285 or a frequency of 9.3802 again very close to 9.5 gigahertz again if we wanted to measure this more accurately first of all we wouldn't be bending up this cheap brass to form our waveguides you'd probably want to purchase a section of waveguide to get better resolution you'd probably want to make a slide that's a lot longer than this as well and of course you're going to want to improve the mounts Again, you can see what I've done here is I've soldered in a piece of copper shim. This is roughly the height of our SMA connector. And then I've soldered this brass plate over the top of it. And that basically holds this connector down to the waveguide. So this isn't real smooth. You can see it's kind of tight. So that makes it pretty difficult to make these adjustments. Okay, remember going back to this university paper, they show this crystal detector mounted on the end of their probe and then this going off to a meter let me just read a little bit from here it says the key addition here is the crystal detector which will change the RF voltage into a DC current and will be read by the meter so we use a square law detector these detectors have an output proportional to the square of the input so again square being a square of the electric field in the probe so I max is equal to E squared max for small current conditions so here I have a small microwave detector diode. What we can do is detach our port 2. And we'll go ahead and replace that with our diode. And we'll just torque that down like so. Alright, here you can see I have my Bryman BM869S out. We're going to be using this as our detector. So you can see I have our short applied. Let's try measuring our BSWR now. Again, we'll start out by looking for the peak. So there's two millivolts. Let's go ahead and select our high resolution mode. People tell me that that's a gimmick. I happen to use it quite often. Oh, is that it? 3.6. Let's see if we can get it a little better. Four point four. Oh, 4.6. Problem with the slide, it's very touchy. Right about here. 5. 5.1 something. Five point one. Three zero. All right, let's try finding our minimum now. <laughs> yeah. It's lower than what the meter can probably read. There's a point 0.1. There's a zero zero. <laughs> yeah, our meter is not going to be sensitive enough. Um, let's call it zero zero. So again, for VSWR, we're going to take the voltage max divided by the voltage min and the square root of that. So we're taking a maximum of 5.130 millivolts divided by 0 0.002 millivolts and that's uh, 2565 and we take the square root of that and that's like uh, 50.6 to 1
And so 50 to 1 VSWR with a short. Now all we're going to do is remove our short. We'll just let this thing pump out into the air. And now again, let's try to find our maximum. Oof. You can see right now, look at the differences. I just kind of slide this thing along. 6, 4, 6, 3, 9, 5, 9, 5, 4, 9. There's a 1. 1. 1.1. So if we use 1.1 divided by 0.3 square root of that, it gives us a 2 to 1 BSWR. So compared to 50 to 1, having this thing opened up is actually... A much better match for this next test we're going to be using some ferrite here I have two flat slabs of it these came from TDK this is a HF 57 SH material you can see these were made for a ribbon cable all I did was break the ferrite and pull these two pieces off so one of the things with ferrite you'll notice I've got my little Bryman meter out we're in the resistance mode, and you can see if I short the leads together, we're reading 0 0.08 ohms. Let's see what happens if I try to measure this ferrite material. You can see it's an open. Let's try it in conductance mode. And you can see, even in conductance mode, we're reading essentially an open at 0, 0.00 nanosiemens. But notice when we take a magnet and we get near these. Huh. Of course the makeup of the material varies quite a bit depending on the application. But this is what we'll be using for these next experiments. So for these next experiments we'll be running at the top end of what the light VNA can run without all of this up conversion. Of course we'll be using the up conversion. So you can see I've got our CW frequency set for 1.34 gigahertz. That gives us a start frequency of 9.2 gigahertz. Again we'll just change it to X axis. And right now you can see again we have the port open up at the end. Let's just go ahead and we'll select the max hold. And again, if I just kind of slide this thing along, you get an idea for the working range with an open. So we'll just set this somewhere to the center. Now, what I have here is a small piece of foam block. I'm just going to stuff this into the end of this. And you can see it really has no effect on our signal. Let's go ahead and remove this now. Now let's go ahead and apply our short. You can see the signal's already a lot higher. And let's adjust it down. Oh, right there. It's about the minimum. Again, it's tough to find these uh, mins and maxes with this. Right about there. Okay, so that's roughly our full range right there. So now, what I'm going to do is insert this little block. Here I have two pieces of ferrite, and you can see they're kind of angled. And let's just stuff these in the end of our tube. We'll use our needle nose pliers here to shove her up in there a little deeper. There we go. Okay, so now let's move our slide and see what happens. Huh. Look at that. So, you can see now the reflected signal is a lot lower. Let's see if we can get it down right in here is our min point. So maybe 22, 23 dB versus, you know, 48. So that ferrite is actually absorbing some of that EM field and dissipating it as heat. 
rather than placing the ferrite across the broad length of our waveguide I've got another piece and we're going to mount this one vertically and we'll space it a little distance away from the edge so again we'll just put it in this way here and again we'll take our needle nose just kind of slide that up in there like so, you can see it's fairly deep and again we'll just cap off the end and now let's see what happens right there you can see we can't get anywhere near that 50 db right there it's going back up right there now what I have here is a magnet what I'm going to do is just place this right over the top of our piece of ferrite you can see right where it wants to rest oops see that now watch what happens again we're looking for a minimum Let's see how we can get a lot lower here Right about there, so quite a bit lower. Let's try moving our magnet and flipping the orientation. Does that make any difference? Wouldn't think it would. But you can see quite a bit lower. Again, if we go ahead and remove our magnet, see the signal going up. And again, we'll place the, oops, and again, we'll place the magnet back over the top, and the signal goes back down, up, and down. <laughs> so here I have another magnet, and I have some iron strapping attached to the two sides. You can see these aren't glued or anything. So what I'm going to do now is straddle our brass with this magnet and let's see what happens wow look at that even lower look at that 36 38 so of course now we have our flux concentrators attached and that ferrite is sitting right between them can we adjust it a little lower now doesn't look like it But definitely a lot lower than we were getting with our single magnet. Again, we remove it. You can see it comes right back up. And as we slide it over the top of our piece of ferrite. So we could actually use this to modulate the waveform. I read somebody's doctorate thesis where they were actually using ferrite to make a directional antenna that they could turn by applying a bias to their ferrite kind of like what we're doing here so if you look up an isolator or a circulator you'll see that they'll take ferrite and bias it with a magnet like this to form those circuits you also see them use it to form switches well I think that's going to be it for this video hopefully you enjoyed seeing our slotted waveguide in action and hopefully I've given you some confidence in the measurements that we've made using this extender. So I may do one more video again. I was talking about 3D printing parts. This is two of the 3D printed horns. The files for these were online. All I did was just download them. The one on the left, this has all been wet sanded. And the one on the right, the orange is just the raw material. These are printed in PLA. I had some silver latex paint that I was hoping to spray over these. Unfortunately, the can had dried up, so in order to use these, we'll have to look for another source of some kind of conductive paint. But you can see basically the texture difference after wet sanding versus the original stack up. Now, of course, these are printed vertically this way, so this is the table. 
so when you're printing it there's nothing to support this outside edge so you can see it's got a bit of a texture to it of course the inside where we care this is all you know fairly smooth or smooth as it's going to get but again a little bit of wet sanding seems to have taken care of that on the back side I took a flat plate and then I wet sanded this to get this true what I'm planning on doing is keep this one just basically raw and then we'll just coat it as is and see how these two perform I think to go any further with this it'd be nice to maybe have one of these out of metal or maybe make another one out of circuit boards as the same dimension I don't know we'll see well that's gonna be all for now hopefully we'll see you in the next video later